Like doing this thing? Okay. Um, I guess we could start. Uh, so my name is Stephen Oliver. Um, you may or may not know me from Peace T-shirts. I've been doing that for years in the Common Ground Fair over in the political action, uh, social and political action area. I'm also on the board of Peace Action Maine and work with them on that and throughout the year. Uh, I have a background as an artist, a sculptor, a woodworker, and a hist I'm also a history buff. And I write some poetry on a lot of things that I think about. Um, so this year's a little different from the fair. I'm actually sharing some of my uh, uh, poetry out loud. I did one year write a piece for, uh, the, I think, the virtual year we had during the pandemic. I wrote a piece uh, to be published. Um, so I, I created a triptych. Uh, the idea is the power of unity. We're obviously in a place called unity. Uh, it's a triptych of poems and prose that reveals Maine's centrality to healing of environmental, social, and historical justice. These are all based on things I've discovered in either and or experienced over the years here in Maine. I'm trying to give you a little bit of description because you might, I don't want you to get lost in all the things I'm going to say. So unity is not just an ideal, it's a reality of our collective bond to history, the environment and the issues and events that impact our world. Unity is both a fate and a choice. The beauty of unity is that it can aspire to become sustainable and ideal out of the most difficult issues. Unity is not just the crucible of fate, but of hope. Unity, the triptych of poetry and prose intends to reveal connections and possibility of, of Maine's relationship to three areas, racial, environmental, and social justice. Racial justice, rooted in our country's art, original sin of slavery, the man behind the Clotilda, the last shape to, ship to bring slaves to America, was originally from Maine. We are all bound to the residual impacts of a horrible system which laid the foundations of the modern world economy. But we, can do, but, but, but we can do things to heal this incredibly deep wound. I truly believe the people of Maine, especially those gathered this weekend in unity, would enthusiastically embrace an effort to heal uh, what involves honestly, in, 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 to heal that honestly involves embracing our history. Environmental justice. New levels of advocacy for environmental justice are, are possible from Maine. Rachel Carson <coughs> was able to, was, uh, able to assemble an astounding amount of knowledge uh, that spanned the globe, its history, and connected it with the universal our origins in an effort to steer our universal fate to a sustainable direction. Maine is, was a place beloved by Carson, and it, it was a sanctuary for her as she gathered information to build a case against the pervasive poisoning of our environment with both nuclear waste and dangerous pesticides. What would she think if she were to observe how our world's climate was changing? I believe she would hear that the environment is trying to tell us that, and would agree that in order to avoid a silent spring, we should not be so silent. Third area is social justice. At the heart of social justice is the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness that we enjoy, enabled by the simple ability to, to be safe and alive. Gun violence, particularly in the form of mass shootings, presents a serious challenge to the basic ability to keep our communities safe in order to thrive. Last October 25th, Maine experienced the most horrific mass shooting in Lewiston, Maine, made possible by an AR-15 style weapon, a weapon of war. A great irony is that this style of weapon was quietly manufactured in Maine near Lewiston and more significantly popularized throughout the country. The people of Maine have responded on numerous levels to heal this horrible inflicted, self-inflicted wound. I believe we can further augment these efforts and help the nation heal from gun violence by augmenting one aspect of those efforts, love. So now I'll begin. Aspiration of paradise. In unity we stand. 39 miles from Whitefield, Maine, also once a paradise. A sanctuary for Irish immigrants fleeing desolation. By ship they came, making a life farming rich dark earth. A family named Mir. Fort the fortitude to go from arriving on ships to building ships, adding ballast to steady their lives and their future generations. Whitefield still sparks, sparkles with beauty, a rich opportunity to live harmoniously. What happened to disrupt their paradise? 
what caused seven of eight mere children to leave further handicapping a father working the land with only one good leg. A spiritual desolation had come as cotton and slaves boomed in the South, drawing the mere children away. Mobile, Alabama was quite an epicenter. One could make a fortune at the center of the slave economy. One could marry into fortunes made through the slave economy. <clears throat> it was a new, greater, and faster way to add ballast to lives and future generations to seemingly add stability, longevity, was its deception. Rooted in an evil system, a, black, a plague of black death, blanketing the land of the stolen obelisk and thereby the world, the ballast may have built a new world economy, but it also created a bottomless abyss, a ship with no hull, hovering over inordinate blackness. When they left paradise to sell souls, to rip up paradise elsewhere, making other lives desolate, they sold themselves also but it seemed a lucrative wager. Timothy was one of the seven who left. His wager was the greatest. His crime had the most impact. His shipbuilding and business prowess would launch the Clotilda, the last shape, ship to a slave ship to arrive on America's shores. Its goal was to stealth 125 souls from Africa to Mobile, Alabama, evading morality, the law, and the punishment of death. He would instruct his captain and crew to burn the evidence the hull sank and quenched in the bayou of the Mobile River. Hidden toxicity near 12 Mile Island, the hull lay largely intact in the mud, a crucible to be raised and relit, to show evidence of slavery, America's seemingly eternal flame, but also signaling a more righteous quenching, a purification. Mir dispersed the surviving slaves throughout a landscape three miles north of Mobile and beyond, a landscape marked with red obelisks bearing the Mir name, further defining the path of manifest destiny, adding to the construction lines of a systemic injustice which stretched from Mobile across the nation, connecting rivers and railroad lines and cotton fields and ports, ships, oceans, and economies. When the Civil War fought over the spoils of this system and, the, and it ended, when the survivors were freed and formed a village called Africa Town, the only town in America founded by Africans, a seed of healing was also planted. It began to sprout with possibility when the Clotilda re-emerged. Raised by voices of conscience, voices of descendants, journalists, and anthropologists over generations, these included Zora Neale Hurston, whose manuscript documenting African, Africatown emerged from a vault sealed, by decades, sealed for decades by racism, just prior to the Clotilda's physical rediscovery. A barracoon opened. A truer freedom in America now postulating if we, pension, if we pay attention, if we act. The evidence is, of the ship is expounded in the 159 years since its burning and sinking. The fires of racism, racism still burned. Africa Town, founded by 110 African souls, for all this time has been assaulted. Its boundaries have been strangled. Its earth, water, and air poisoned. Its lives, life assaulted by industry taken by cancer, asphalt, scrap metal, pipe manufacturing, oil and gas, even tar sands continue to try to fuel the crucible that is Africa Town. We have the opportunity to stand in unity with the descendants of the 110 souls who survived to found Africa Town, with all those who helped preserve their story in realizing Africa Town as not just a crucible for slavery's seemingly eternal flame, but as a key nexus for resolving America's seemingly eternal shame. We can stand shoulder to shoulder with the descendants as this community with unlikely main roots rises and becomes a shining example of how to right old wrongs while building something racially and environmentally sustainable by building a sustainable and moral economy, a precedent enabling our nation to live up to its espoused ideals. We can help build new construction lines. We can stand in unity 39 miles from Whitefield, where the sun bleached a white obelisk marking the place of Timothy Mare's progenitors, whose lines run straight to Mobile, passing through the heart of the nation, through the Washington Monument itself, the visage of a stolen obelisk. Standing in unity, we can change its hue from the red of blood, from the austere bleaching of guiltless, of guiltless white, to shades of blue coloring the surrounding sky with respect, peace, love, and hope 
in Unity, in Unity, Maine, we can stand with Africa Town. Pause. Just 30 miles from that sun-bleached stone obelisk in Whitefield is a place called Silver Ledges. No doubt named for rich stone strata left sparkling, exposed to the pounding of the sea. Names, the name Silver, Ledge, Silver Ledges was by a local resident, Rachel Carson. She gloried in the nature that surrounded her. Her, sur her surveying of nature poetically and scientifically rendered nature's totality. She saw evidence of the seas, the beginnings in the rocks and stars. She looked through the eyes of creatures immersing herself in the flow of nature and the wind and the water of the coastline. She tracked the birth of Mother Earth and how the moon helped birth the sea, still tethered by gravity. She described a time when Earth had no voice before soil and plants. The constant arrival of ocean waves at these shores mirrored the waves of information coming into her sharp mind. The observations from eyes and ears of scientists, colleagues across the globe, these became her observations, all becoming threaded together. She studied and revealed intersectionality before it was a common term. Carson imbibed the discovery of continental plate tectonics discovered by another woman, Mary Tharp, a woman like herself who was not allowed to join actual expeditions because of their gender. Their talents shined irregardless. Mother Earth speaks through those who are smart enough to care and nurture, regardless of sex. She also speaks directly and will not be silenced. The brilliance of this woman was, was still akin, was akin to the light shining on the surface of the sea, constructing an arc of nature's time. From before dry land existed, awaiting gestation through the forces of the universe. Through the, through the age when mariners used birds to tell them of land in the distance and of safe harbors, together unifying and making navigable land masses torn asunder by the centuries. To the age where science threatened the very sustainability of nature on atomic and chemical levels, Carson correctly paralleled the impact and the residue of DDT to that of the atomic bomb. She came away with a conviction that the planet and the seas are not just something to exploit or to enslave in the race towards oblivion that we must act against the forces that created, we must not act against the forces that created life, that continue to enable our life, that we live a sustainable, sustainably and in unity to prevent nature from being irretrievably silenced. It was not just the birds that she foresaw in the state of deadly science, it was the planet. And for this reason, she said, there would be no peace for me if I kept silent. Carson wrote, the sea around us, then silent spring, two years before her death of cancer in 1964. That was the year I was born. I stand in unity with her. Will you stand in unity also? Will you not be so silent? I have visited the Carson Preserve where I felt a fleeting, a safe but fleeting removal from the larger impacts of, the climate, cha of climate change that, that our world is experiencing. It was a place to pause and gather hope to make choices, to see glimmers of hope shining up beneath the canopies of pines from adjacent waters. Light is too fast to catch once it has passed us, but we can face forward into its stream for enlightenment. To hear the voice of a dead tree with its sentinel arms outstretched in warning, yet still accommodating the pecking of woodpeckers. To feel the distant connection conjured by tears shed for a stranded dolphin. To breathe in life, which in kindness leaves render for our lungs. To hear on the radio about black oxygen, a newly discovered source of life based on not photosynthesis, but chemical reactions deep from within the oceans that Carson so arduously studied. I believe she knew about this, she would also feel a sense of hope that a deafening and deadly silence might not be mankind's fate. So must remain, we must remain awake to create a level of environmental advocacy, a not so silent spring. Some would have us sleep, unable to see, unable to feel, unable to act, perhaps unable to love. 71 miles from where we stand in unity, the production of AR-15 weapons was silently taking place, but simultaneously making greater noise across the nation, becoming popular, becoming unfettered, becoming licentious in the wrong hands. 
What are the right hands? For weapons of war, on October 25th, 2023, gunfire accompanied by a collective and effective apathy and numbness was allowed to silence 18 lives in Lewiston, including members of the Maine's deaf community. Stripping a veil between those with and without hearing, the same bullets would take any of us in a state of unknowing, unhearing, with the same effect of immortal silence. A phone call broke my, broke my silence that night, just an hour after the news broke, to which I had been unaware. 36 miles from where I stood that night, solitary, beneath the moonlight, picking apples to bake pies, as gifts of love, gifts of love to friends, in a town with a motto of love always, Bridgeton, Maine, gazing into, a leafy, into leafy canopies of apple trees, the orb of a full moon eclipsed by each sweet discovery, I was moved to reflect, to feel, to see that love grows like apples on those trees, stretching far beyond where we see, just as numerous as the leaves, an incredibly beautiful majesty, that the moon shining with its light had witnessed treachery that night, saw, seeing sweetness fall to the ground out of sight and out of sound, that a rainbow was shattered that night, the broken crystals of its light left to sparkle on the ground, that these were beautiful people of Lewistown, that those that remain have something to say, that those beautiful people will, will have their day as we push back on hateful ways, taking a new position called love always, that those that remain will have their way, that beautiful people lost will have their day to guide the nation's future with the help of a small town called Bridgeton in the spirit of love always. The love can grow even more on those trees, yet further beyond where we see, becoming much more numerous than the leaves, all one love, one canopy, that the moon still spreading beauty with its light might help banish treachery from the night, raising sweetness from the ground, sending, lo sending loving legacies glory bound, that the rainbow shattered is still so bright even in crystal shines its light, sparkling up from the ground, filling the silence with love's sound. That that rainbow that shattered is still so bright, the whole town shimmers with its light, blazing a path to follow in the night, up the street and out of sight. Get that sparkle on your shoes, the kind of soul you cannot lose. Kiss this ground and say I do, unfold a constant love haiku. Lewiston and Maine will have their way, the beautiful people will have their day with an elevated conscience of love always. The power of unity can rise and stay. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Comments? <laughs> Questions? <laughs> you have somebody else coming up? No, no one else coming up yet. I don't want to get in front of you. If you give me your email address before we leave, you know, it'll probably get refined some more. But yeah, you know, it's, I did this with the intention of trying to share it more broadly uh, to try to make an impact. That's my sort of hope that art and poetry can make an impact, you know, we, we so uh, desperately need in the world, you know? Yes. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> nice to finally see Brussels Poetry Grove. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much.